Welcome. I have today with me Dr. Hans Kluge, uh, the Regional Director of the WHO in Europe, and Professor Patricia Burra, the Chair of the um, Public Affairs Committee from UEG. Hans, we heard you during the plenary session, and I would like to discuss with you some burning issues which maybe we both feel to be addressed. And I very much like the quote you gave during your uh, panel presentation from your father, who was a practitioner, um, that the intestine is the soul of the human being. Right. And I like this a lot because what I learned from my mentor is, um, he always told me, in the gut you have more neurons than you have yeah. in the brain. Yeah. So if people have some stress, are sick with any other things, it reflects on the abdomen. So that is something uh, which I think uh, is, is important to, um, to realize. Now, we heard you speak about the hospitals in crisis today during the panel uh, discussion. And we are facing many problems here today with and after the COVID pandemic, the growing inequalities. And you said the physician must the, be the guardian of yes. equality, which I also like a lot, this quote of yours. And I would very much like to elaborate on the problems you see the key priorities, really, uh, that we need to address to ensure the well-coordinated and highly quality of healthcare for all European citizens. Actually, Professor, if I look back one year ago, I would say that we felt there was a feeling of exhaustion, but also very hopeful that with the COVID-19 pandemic largely behind us, the health systems would be resilient. For me, resilience means to bounce back stronger from a crisis. Unfortunately, it hasn't happened. No. And I see three main reasons. The first one, which we also discussed this morning, Professor Marcel was speaking about this, is the health and care workforce crisis. One year ago, I called it a ticking time bomb, but since then it had become quite dramatic. It's a bit of a paradox, because never in history we had so many doctors and nurses in our region but we are short of about 1.8 million in the European region alone. 18 million globally. And of course, it's linked with the bigger picture of demographic aging. Yes. We have a population which has more and more comorbidities and more needs and expectations. And then there is a labor force shortage across all sectors. So this is one. The second one is the crisis of the medicines. I remember very well a couple of months ago, UK, France had shortage of essential antibiotics, of paracetamol, because they're not produced anymore in our region. At the same time, there is the rising cost of the, what we call novel, the innovative medicines. And the third one is almost amazing. Minister after minister of health is telling me that despite of the fact that 7 million people died of the COVID-19, it's very tough for them to keep the same level of investment in health systems. So these are three very important crisis moments, which for me actually means they all bleed into each other. And it means that this artificial division we used to make between non-communicable, communicable disease, environmental health, personal health, in fact, fade away. We almost can tragically predict who will die first when the next crisis comes around, yeah. based on the experience of the last four years. Three groups. Number one, the people with the lowest health reserves, the youngest and the oldest. Number two, the people with the least access to okay. power and resource in society. And the third one, the people with pre-existing chronic conditions in Italy, from all the patients who died in the hospitals COVID-19, two thirds had hypertension, one third had diabetes type two. Yeah. This is very, very uh, sad and very, very serious. Patricia, would you like to elaborate on this and tell something more about your thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I think uh, uh, Dr. Kluber reminded me the, what was said today during the opening about a hospital crisis. And actually, it's been, uh, let's say, two, three years that I'm quite worried about what is happening with the young medical doctors. I think in, in, in medicine, when they are medical students are still enthusiastic about doing medicine, when they qualify, they have to choose uh, the discipline, they have to choose which uh, school of specialization they have to feel affiliated, that um, they feel unsure. Uh, we have seen, at least in Italy, my country, that uh, since uh, at least two years, uh, there are less attendance uh, regarding emergency medicine, 
uh, intensive care anesthesia, and some part, some university also surgery. Uh, so I, we worried about gastroenterology and the, the common uh, link of those uh, specialties that are very demanding. So I think, first of all, uh, they don't want to, to work as much as we used to work in when we, we were uh, in, a, in a specialization school. Uh, surely, I don't want to take the COVID as an excuse, but surely something happened with the COVID in terms of also psychologically. And uh, uh, some of them complain because in Europe we have different salaries if you compare one country to the other country, which is uh, unacceptable. So I think it's just a combination of few factors. But let's say that I, I feel I'm also in my position at university, I'm vice rector for the, for the post uh, laurem training. And I'm really worried about this changing in, in, in the yeah. attitudes and, and probably is something that is, uh, uh, is changing in our society. Mm. Yes, absolutely. It is a worrying fact. I always try to see whether the glass is half empty or half yeah. full. But you're absolutely uh, right. I, I was mentioning about uh, the crisis. Actually, in April, we organized a meeting with all 53 member states in the region, European region, in Bucharest, on the future of the health and care workforce. Yeah, right. Usually, if we invite 50 countries, we have about 30, 32. We had all of them. So it's the Very number impressive. one preoccupation. And we came out with three main concerns by the countries. Number one is the working conditions. Yes. Number two is, as you're mentioning, is the mental health and well-being. Our service show that 40%, for example, of the nurses have some signs yeah, yeah, of yeah, yeah. burnout. Actually, my own staff with the survey, 30%. And 60% of my staff faces unsustainable work burden, which is the same in the hospitals or also in the primary health care. And then the third one is the difficulty. How do you provide hospital care in rural areas where it's difficult to have a referral system to what we call secondary hospitals? Mm -hmm. So everything starts, I would say, with a good forecasting and planning. Countries who have numerous clauses, is it something that needs to be foreseen? I mean, in my own country, in Belgium, there is numerous clauses, which is difficult for some of my colleagues who are quite bright, who are not accepted, but then they accept people from Germany, from the Netherlands, because of the European Commission. So I think a lot can be done already with, I would say, common sense. Governance, workforce planning is number one. Number two, we have to acknowledge that there is a feminization of the workforce. Absolutely. Here, a brilliant example is Ireland. Ireland was the first of our 50 member states which has a national action plan on mental health and well-being of its workforce. To give a simple example, that mothers, doctors, don't have to worry during the yes. COVID-19 what to do with their kids. There is a corner. They take care of the family well-being. And of course, as a parent, everyone who has children, mm -hmm. myself too, if I don't have to worry about my daughters that they're being taken care, I can concentrate on the work. But you have a point. I compare it with my father. He used, actually, I say he doesn't work so much anymore, but he still works maybe eight hours at 19, but he used to work 24-7. This is different. So I don't know, honestly, what is better. That's why multidisciplinary teams are important, but for specialization like gastroenterology, I fully acknowledge that yesterday approaches do not solve today's challenges. No. And I mean, coming from Sweden, uh, there several of these issues are addressed. Women have health yeah. have healthcare. Women have uh, the daycare for the children. Excellent. You don't have Bravo. to care about this. Yeah. And with this large country, also we do a lot of medicine as telemedicine. Yes. yes. And I think that is uh, maybe addressing some of the issues yes. you are raising. If you may, Professor, because I was uh, six nine months ago in Westerbotten, Westerbotten, in Sweden, yes, where we assigned as a WHO official accredited project the region there. It was amazing. I was there in this uh, emergency center. They brought in a, a patient with trauma. The nurses were doing the chest X-ray, were doing all the examinations. And there was a doctor, I think, sitting in Stockholm, basically making the diagnosis. Yeah. So telemedicine, as you rightly say, yeah. was deciding about life or death. Bravo. Yes. Thank you. Now, let's come a little bit to uh, your expectations. You are now uh, the director since 2020, I suppose. Right. And you have a strategic plan and you talk about your dream of a society where no one is left yes. behind, which I like a lot. And this, again, is something which is very much Swedish 
everybody should have the same chances, the same yeah. care, the same access to healthcare. So a region where people-centered and sustainable public health and healthcare services are available. So the question is now, after three and a half years in office, what is your interim assessment in terms of achieving these UN 2030 yeah. sustainable development goals in the area three um, to reduce mortality for non communicable diseases. Yes. Hans. Actually, I'm prepared for this question because next week I have my <laughs> annual board meeting. It's okay. called the Regional Committee in Astana, Kazakhstan for my 53 Minister of Health. And actually, if I look back, when I started as Regional Director, this region was so-called disaster resilient. Oh. There was no any crisis of global impact. Since then, we, had, we were the epicenter of the COVID-19. Then we still have, unfortunately, a devastating war in Ukraine. Every five months, I go to the front line. In December, I will go again because I think it's going to be a very cold, literally, winter for the people. Now, we have the war Israel-Gaza. And last week, I came back from the South Caucasus, oh, yeah, yeah. where there were 100,000 plus people from Karabakh coming to Armenia with the explosion at the gas station with 200 uh, burned people. So we see, and then now it's a bit more quiet in the Balkan. So this is the number one. It's the preparedness that every country needs to have a national preparedness plan. Because I remember that in the beginning of the COVID-19, went to Spain, to Italy, many countries didn't have We're a national prepared. plan, basically. Yeah. So in that sense, WHO is also a paradigm shift for us, that WHO is no longer an organization for, let's say, the lower income countries. Some of our strongest health systems were completely overwhelmed. Yeah. So that's the paradigm shift I tried to make, that WHO is not just to assist, it's an exchange. Now, on the SDGs, unfortunately for the non-communicable diseases, we really have a backtrack. We have about 100 weeks until the UN high-level meeting in New York in 2025, and we urgently need to scale up. The good news is we know what are the big risk factors. And there, every gastroenterologist, every local hospital manager can help mm. on tobacco, having smoke-free hospital. Yes. Still, when I went there, I think in one of my own uh, uh, cities in Belgium, there was a smoking room. I was very surprised. <laughs> Number two, alcohol. In WHO, we no longer serve alcohol because we know there is no safe level of drinking. Previously, okay. we used to say two glasses, but especially it can cause mm. breast cancer for the women. We have to tell this also for the men. Number three, physical inactivity. We did a survey with the OECD in all 50 countries. One out of two adults mm never ever of his or her life does any form of exercise. If, and there the doctors who have a lot of credibility still and prestige in the society, could encourage the people. They don't have to run marathons. 80 minutes a day could save 10,000 premature deaths a year and 8 billion euro in the 27 EU countries. Mm. And then the other one which concerned me a lot, for the first time in 25 years, in our richest countries in the region, we have children going to bed with a hungry stomach. So there, everyone can help on government procurement mechanism for a healthy, nutritional diet for our children. Mm. So it's all doable. The good thing is we, we know what needs to be done, but we need leadership. Yes. We need leadership, really. Apparently, you are providing this, at least for your, I suppose. Yes, but I need all your support. Yes. Because I say we have a deficit of trust in society, and I mm. see this. One of the last population groups that people trust are the doctors. That's true. But uh, let's look a little bit more for uh, the gastroenterology. I mean, our overarching team is digestive health. Yes. And if you could maybe have uh, some few thoughts more on what is the non communicable disease part where you think uh, what are the goals there for yes. uh, your um, uh, European you know, uh, part of the WHO yes. maybe? I think straight away would be that any local initiative to be tailored and building up to the global SDG targets. Okay. So what's important is not only to provide the clinical service, but to have from a public health point of view, do a analysis. What is the incidence prevalence of gastrointestinal disease in the community? What are the risk factors? What are the risk behaviors? And then what are the outcomes? Because it are those local initiatives which ultimately mm. build up to the SDG initiatives. And we can do it on tobacco, on alcohol abuse, on physical inactivity, 
on visitors. Dijk. Very, very concrete. Number yeah. two is for the local managers to link with the social services. Because what we see is that there was a brilliant presentation uh, this morning. I liked it a lot. But this is for the patients who arrive in the hospital. Even in Belgium, our Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Health, Frank van der Broeke, had to free 5.5 million euro for people up to 24 years who are financially vulnerable. So there's unmet needs. People who don't come to the gastrointestinal doctor. So we need to link between the clinical service and what's happening in the local community yeah. and the local society. Yeah. That, that's very, very interesting. Um, let's dive a little bit de deeper into the challenges posed by the socioeconomic um, problems and lifestyle factors which you just mentioned, uh, and particularly in the context of the increasing burden of GI diseases, digestive health, in Europe. And we are talking about evidence and you doing your investigations and we actually also contributed to that. I'm very happy Excellent. to give you this so-called White Book Edition 2, which is uh, the UEG's most recent pan-European study, not only the EU, a little bit going beyond that, not only including the United Kingdom, and economic burden of digestive diseases and cancers, which highlights precisely this burden associated with alcohol, smoking, obesity, unhealthy diets. So these are the major risk factors which we have very much um, dived into, looked into, have evidence which is actually used in Brussels by our constituencies in, in the parliament. So um, Patricia, you were very much involved in uh, putting this white book together. And as the chair of our public affairs group, uh, also it is uh, involved in the dissemination process, yep. process on the national and GI uh, European level. From your point of view, what were some of the maybe unexpected uh, key findings from this project, which are in the book, and what chances do you hope to see, specifically in the management of, say, liver disease at the European or national level? Yes, I think, uh, um, first of all, we had an amazing number of data. Uh, we are perfectly in line with what Hans is saying. And uh, uh, the, the, the work that was done at this uh, specialized agency from, from Liverpool, agency from the University of Liverpool, they really uh, uh, show the data that can confirm what you just said. And uh, we have the number now about the incidence, the prevalence and the mortality uh, for each one of the gastrointestinal diseases, including cancer, for the different organs. And that uh, it was unfortunately unexpected to have such a strong association between the modifiable risk factors and uh, uh, mortality. So that is really something that you will find in the booklet and uh, uh, it's, it's coming from the 49 national uh, 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 countries and uh, including the data for 20 years from 20, 2000 to 2019 and uh, unfortunately we have to confirm the negative impact of what you said, uh, inadequate alcohol consumption and, and smoking, the unhealthy diet uh, uh, with the fat, uh, with the sugar and uh, uh, when we had to today, for example, uh, we had the, the, this round table with the patient organizations. Um, a year ago, when we wanted to organize this meeting, we asked them, what do you like as a patient? Uh, what do you expect from us? And they, they listed uh, uh, prevention, primary prevention. Uh, they listed the, the disadvantage to have a delayed diagnosis and, and, and the quality of life. Mm -hmm. So in the book, at least we had the answer about the prevention. And it's uh, absolutely... Uh, clear that the medical doctors maybe can do something for the secondary prevention, but for the primary prevention, we have to start in the family. Yes. So the family with the parents have to teach the children, then they go to school, the teachers have to, 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 to teach the, 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 the students, and, and then maybe we'll be in the university, and then after the university, we can pay our, our part. But surely uh, we need a, a strategy at the national level, the local level, to, to, to improve the prevention about these risk factors. Mm -hmm. It's not really the, the knowledge. Uh, today, the, the, the junior, the adolescent, they use the, the social media, they know everything. Education is different from the knowledge. So they are not educated. That's why they don't understand why drinking or eating or smoking that way, they can cause cancer maybe in, 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 in 20, 30 years yeah. of their life. Yeah. 
And, and the final things that I want you to underline for, 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 for Hans is that so what came out from the white book is that there is, a, as let's say, an economic benefit in reducing yes. the burden yes. of, of GI diseases. Yes. So I think this is a strong message. Yeah. Yes, I have to congratulate you. I mean, it's excellent yeah. uh, work, really, and I endorse everything you say. Maybe some points is that our regional office was the first one, WHO globally, establishing a behavioral and cultural inside unit, exactly as you say. We have a region where people are quite health literate. Yep. They know what is unhealthy, but they still take the unhealthy choice. So we need anthropologists, sociologists to yeah. understand what's in the head of the people. And then we can design together with them to co-create the right strategies, mm. not just to tell, but understand. Just like we use those insights with the anti-vaccination yes. movement. And as you say, to start in the schools, when I asked the Minister of Health in Portugal, what was their success? with the highest vaccination uh, coverage rates, almost in the region, they were telling exactly, as you mentioned, uh, Professor, the children are being taught in the primary school. Yes. So for them, it's a given. There is no it's doubt it's part thing. of healthy life of society. So we yeah. have to start much earlier. Yes, mm -hmm. much earlier. The White Book, uh, uh, Patricia, is not only a research tool, but also a very nice advocacy, advocacy yep. tool. Yes. Absolutely. And I think maybe you could relate to us what you have done with that in Brussels. Yes, exactly. Um, we, we had the opportunity to organize on behalf of UEG an event in Brussels on the 26th of April. It was very well attended and we had, uh, let's say, the scientific part of the meeting was uh, dedicated to report the summary of the White Book. And we discuss about uh, the chronic intestinal uh, uh, diseases, about the pancreatic disease, yes. about liver disease. And then uh, we had a, a, a part uh, entirely dedicated to, the, uh, uh, to cancers. And uh, we had uh, attending all the uh, uh, representation from the patient association. Excellent. And, and then uh, in late in the afternoon, uh, we had the plan to, to meet six MEPs. All six accepted to, to talk to us. Mm -hmm. We had very nice conversation. I thought they were very well prepared. So and they understood what we are talking about. Um, I think there is an improvement uh, at, uh, at the level of EU Parliament in terms of uh, yeah. also understanding understanding mm. what we are saying compared to my previous experience. It was, I think, with you 12 years ago. So I think that is very important. That, that is very important. Yeah. It was a very and positive experience. And one of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Kremling Vikara yes. Samnye, yes. was part of this uh, uh, initiative yeah. and was also uh, you know, part of this uh, visit of the UEG. Now, picking up on, on, on the next point, on the last point with the European Parliament, um, we will have elections next year in the European Parliament and we'll see a new European Commission, maybe even a new um, a president, so to say. We all know that that is a very important election because of the polarization in politics in Europe, not only to say with the far-right parties, which, which you have rising in the polls. So my question to you, Hans, is, Considering the multiple crises which we already have touched upon, we are facing in Europe today, the war, inflation, healthcare shortage, you name it, climate, yes. we have talked about climate. What are your biggest concerns and hope looking into the future now for Europe? Yes, this is the, the, the very big uh, uh, question, but we're working a bit on that one with the future Belgium EU presidency in the beginning of next year to yes. prepare for the, as you rightly say, Professor, very important, the uh, to position health high on the next European Commission. So a number of points here is that number one, we need to be better prepared if another pandemic happens, because it's going come. to happen. Yeah. And the key issue which concerns me and actually which keeps me awake at night, which is not solved, is the whole issue of equal access to medical countermeasures, to vaccines. If tomorrow there is another pandemic, I'm not sure honestly that we're better prepared to have an equal access to vaccines. We saw this national vaccine hoarding. So this is one. Within the EU with HERA, this is much better, but the EU will never be safe without its neighbors. So this is one very, very big one. The second one you alluded to, Professor, is the climate change. Yeah. I think there we need to find a way to explain to the people that this is not a looming crisis. It's already there. I remember the Deputy Prime Minister of Malta, Dr. Fern, calling me uh, during the July heat wave, this is normally a period that the health systems takes a take a breath during summer before the rise of diseases in autumn. Patient admissions doubled, emergency calls doubled, deaths from hypertemia. So yeah. we need to think through 
how to prepare our health systems for this extreme weather events yeah. because this is not going to get better. Away, this no. Exactly. Number two. And number three, I mentioned this morning, I'm very, very concerned about the mental health, yeah. not at least in our use. And I'm convinced that we, what we find from our service is the tip of the iceberg, which actually comes back to my first point, the importance of your profession. And I tell this sincerely, that as your professor was telling, uh, so many neurons in the intestine more than the brain. And what my father was telling, that the intestine is the soul oh. of the human being. So we have to be alerted and on the lookout and to get away with the stigma and discrimination. Yes. I always say, everyone has a right to have a mental dip. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as your chair, as your role as the chair of the Public Affairs Committee, what are your expectations for the new European Parliament, Parliament and Commission, Patricia? I have to say that uh, in the most recent years, we have received more attention from uh, the European Parliament in terms of public health. Actually, there is uh, a committee uh, on beating cancer, and uh, they launched also a subcommittee on public health. This is the first time. Actually, we were in, as I said, in Brussels, the 26th of April. And that was, uh, it happened a couple of weeks later, so in May. So we were very, very pleased about that. Uh, we have planned for uh, the, the time of the new election will come in June next year. Uh, to uh, two action actually. One will be to involve uh, uh, the national uh, uh, society's representative. And uh, we started already yesterday. We had the meeting here at UEG with all the representatives for the different countries in Europe. And we launched this, uh, with this uh, uh, proposal to have a, a, a sort of toolkit to be used uh, to raise yes. awareness about the GI diseases, to be used uh, at a local level, uh, hospital, university, institutions, then to move to the national level with the politician that will maybe have in the list of candidates at the beginning of the next year for, for each country. And, and then, of course, be ready for the new uh, uh, European Parliament to see if there will be some MEPs being confirmed, some new MEPs. And I think by uh, autumn, probably, when there will be also the, uh, the president mm. of uh, European Commission be elected, we should really start again. And we'll, we really hope that it will be open to us and ready to listen to us as that was done by the previous uh, legislation. Very well. And I think we as UEG are very well suited to you know, address these things, which if I just sum up now, what we have talked about is maybe starting at the, at the end with the mental health, having implications for the abdomen, for our diseases, then what we call digestive health, yes. which implies you know, um, working against um, alcohol, against tobacco abuse, working against obesity, working, as you just said, for the equality. We must be the guardians of our patients to ensure the equality of healthcare, reach out in the rural areas, Correct. which some countries are doing. And uh, we would very much like to support you in your work, Thank you. at least here in Europe, to accomplish what you would aim to reach, which is also, to a huge extent, our own goal yes. from the United European Gastroenterology. Thank you. Thank so you very much. much for being with us today, My and pleasure. good Thank luck. You. Thank you. With uh, your to work. Thank in you. Together. Europe. Thank you. Together. Thank, Thank, you. Together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. And goodbye. <laughs>